Morning, everybody. This is Todd Sterling. This is, you're in the right place if you're looking for the clean off-road voucher incentive project meeting. Um, just waiting for everybody to get on. We had mm, a little over 200 people sign up for the meeting and uh, still wait for, for uh, some folks to uh, sign on. So let's just give them uh, one more minute. But again, I thank you for being on time. And so we'll, we'll start here in just one minute. Well, everybody, it looks like things have started to level off. Um, people are still signing on, but but pretty slowly. Um, you're in the right place if you're looking for the clean off-road equipment voucher incentive project or core work group meeting number two. <clears throat> uh, my name is Todd Sterling. And uh, let's see how many folks are here now. Let's, let's get this thing started. Let's 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 go ahead and get it started. Um, again, welcome, welcome to the work group this morning. Um, my name is Todd Sterling. I'm the lead staff uh, for this project. Um, I'd like to introduce some of the other staff that, are, that help me with this. I can't do this by myself. Um, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, um, uh, team, uh, Tess, would you like to start out? Hi, I'm Tess Seacat, and I'm the branch chief of the Heavy Duty Off-Road Strategies branch, and one of the projects is CORE, so I'm very excited for this sort of second round of funding and the expansion of the program. Thank you. And uh, Matt Daner? Hi, good morning. My name is Matt Daner. I work under Tess Seacat and supporting Todd and the team in the CORE program as the manufacturer's liaison and also responsible for reviewing the manufacturer's eligibility applications. I'll kick it to Eloy. Super Eloy. Uh, good morning, Eloy Flores, assisting with CORE. Thank you, Eloy. And then Amrit, can I introduce yourself also? Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Amrit. I work for the off-road implementation section and I'll just be helping with some of the logistics for the, uh, for the work group today. Super. Well, let's, let's jump into this. Um, we have quite a few few people have signed up. Um, so wait for some folks to sign in, but you got to be on time, right? Uh, the goal of today's work group is, um, if you're new to CORE, to introduce you to this program. Also, we like to make um, some updates to our implementation manual and the CORE voucher process. The, the, the important thing is we would like your input. No matter if you're a seasoned CORE veteran or new to the program, we welcome your ideas. Before we get started, a little information on the work group logistics today. Uh, the work group is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be posted on the CARBS low carbon transportation webpage within the next few weeks. The presentation isn't terribly long, so I think it's best if you let me run through all the slides and we can answer your questions at the end. Um, at the end, we'll ask you to raise your hand, let us know if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. CARB staff will then unmute your line for those of you participating via phone, please press pound two to raise your hand. Um, you may also use the Q&A box to ask a question. And as always, we appreciate your patience if we run into any technical glitches. Uh, there'll be contact information at the end if you have additional questions after this meeting. Uh, this meeting will end at 11 a.m. to respect everybody's time. If you have questions after this meeting, you can contact me via email and I'll have my contact information at the last slide. Um, if, you have, if there are any unanswered questions in the Q&A, I'll get back to you and answer your questions like it did on the first workgroup meeting. Um, slide number two, Amrit. The agenda to, for today's meeting is here. Uh, we'll be covering a couple things. Uh, a general high level overview of core for folks that are new. Um, also, our proposed um, implementation manual changes 
Uh, these are changes we introduced to the public in January uh, at the work group meeting. We would use, um, we we're using stakeholder feedback and trying to firm up these changes. Uh, the question came up multiple times during the general work group meeting um, about equipment categories. Uh, we'll be having some ideas and uh, we want some uh, stakeholder feedback in the, these ideas also. Uh, there are also many questions on how to apply um, from manufacturers, dealers, owners. Um, while this will be a higher level, it'll provide newcomers an idea how the pro process works. Slide number three, please. Okay, okay, CORE is intended to accelerate the deployment of advanced technology in the off-road sector by providing a streamlined way for fleets to access funding, which will help offset the incremental costs of such technology. CORE targets commercial-ready products, which have not yet achieved significant market foothold. This program allows stacking, which means you can use funding from this program and other incentive programs, but still need to follow incentive rules for both or all. Also, core does not require scrappage of one of, of your current pieces of equipment. The program is first come, first served, and um, we plan on, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, um, we also wanna improve the implementation manual and make changes to the program where it can make it more uh, user-friendly and simpler for fleet to use a voucher process. The past funding source was limiting projects to freight movement equipment, and non-autonomous vehicles. About 75% of these vehicles uh, we added to the California uh, fleet uh, benefited disadvantaged communities in low-income areas. Also, the contingency list that we had from the first round has now been funded. Uh, slide number four, please. All these items were discussed or, or raised, questions raised during the last work group meeting. Um, let's go through each one to help clarify. The first one, uh, dealers and uh, general service admin or GSA, um, we're, we're for some equipment owners, public entities must go through a specific purchasing process. We ran into this during the first round and we received some comments and questions during the, the first work group meeting. We'd like to update the implementation manager to reflect this. We'd like to propose entities may use a GSA vendors but the vendors may must register as core certified dealers and must be listed on the voucher request. Um, as far as hours of use, we'd like to, like to update the hours of use requirement. The implementation manual states equipment must be, operate at least 800 hours per year. We'd like to update to have a minimum hour of use of 200 hours. This would be in line with our other diesel off-road equipment where less than 200 hours would be considered low use. Um, touch on POs, uh, we would like to propose that governmental entities and the public agencies must submit a letter of intent in lieu of a PO when the procurement policies and timelines are prohibitive. Non-governmental non -governmental purchasers who are combining core with other incentives may also be prohibited from issuing a PO at the time of the voucher request. We'd like to update the implementation menu to allow evidence of award to be provided with a letter of intent in lieu of a PO. Manufacturers purchase, we like to provide an option for manufacturers demonstration units. These units must be used for demonstration for at least six months before it can be resold. Also, we like to allow rental companies to buy equipment made by an OEM with shared ownership. And then touching on infrastructure, we'd like to allow um, electric, vehicle supply equipment or EVSE vouchers to be combined or changed as long as the final configuration fuels the same number of equipment pieces at the same or greater level. Also allow EVSE vouchers to be paid directly to property owners or other third parties as designated in the original voucher request. Um, for voucher redemption, upon request from both dealer and purchaser, Voucher checks can be made payable to a third party. For example, directly to the purchaser or financing company, the voucher redemption period increased, could increase to six months with availability of requests up to two 90 day extensions. I uh, also want to touch on this that extensions cannot be extended indefinitely. 
uh, we're asking for your input on uh, what would be a good time to stop these extensions or, or just end them. Uh, so again, we'd like to hear from you on, on these extensions. Uh, slide number five, please. Uh, for, so that for base voucher amounts, uh, we're currently determined these voucher amounts by CARB staff working with CalSTART. Uh, CalSTART is our administrator for this uh, program um, and depend on the incremental cost of, of zero emission equipment over its internal combustion counterpart and other factors, including but not limited to equipment sale price, market data, typical industry standard cost for that equipment technology and type, the need for incentives and other information provided in the manufacturer's core equipment eligibility application. This may be the best way to process voucher amounts until we get more data, especially with the new core equipment categories, which we'll be talking about shortly. Unless stakeholders have ideas on how we can streamline this process. In addition, we would like to streamline the voucher amounts for terminal tractors, set the price at $100,000 per tractor. Terminal tractors are more mature equipment type, and this will speed up the determination process. Slide number six. So this is our proposed list of zero emission off-road equipment categories for core. We have 10 categories of equipment to offer incentives. There are some categories similar to the first round and some additional categories. We're proposing to open the first nine categories all on the same day. With a limitation, no one category can use more than 20% of the total funding of approximately 13.8 million per category. Once category maxes out at the proposed 13.8 million, the category will close. If the category does not max out after a certain number of months, we'll use the remaining funds to roll out voucher offers again for all categories. Also note the new construction uh, category, also agriculture equipment and commercial harbor craft. This is consistent with which, how we launched the program in the past. This provides a wide diversity of equipment to participate in the program. Uh, the first question is, uh, do we think all these categories are correct? Also, how long should these categories be open? Do we think six months is too much time? Is four months okay? Or is two or nine months uh, the right time? So again, we'd like to hear from everybody on this. The 10th category, landscaping equipment category, this is for small businesses or sole proprietors. We'll be having a separate work group meeting just to discuss this category in the coming months. Slide number seven, please. We'd like to keep the program on a first come, first serve voucher application process. If a category fills at the specified time, which we just talked about, uh, we're still wondering how to do. Uh, when small businesses operate in a DAC, we'll get moved to the top of the list. We think it is important to provide small businesses this help. Our thinking is a uh, small business may not have a sp specific staff to have their voucher application in order when core vouchers open. This will provide them extra time. We're seeking stakeholder feedback on ideas how to define either domiciled or operating in, in a DAC or other ways, GPS or, or other measures. How can we do this simply for the operator? Also moving to plus ups, we'd like to offer a plus up for small businesses operating a DAC, adding 15% to the equipment voucher amount. Slide number eight. Um, we think the contingency last lasted a little too long. It was nice to have a list as projects fall off for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have the ability to fund the next project that is ready. Um, we could use, we could, um, could have a list until the funding is spent, close the door at a certain amount of time, move the remaining funds to the next round, or some other option. We're seeking stakeholder feedback on this topic. Slide number nine. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we were asked many times uh, since the last work group, how do I participate in CORE? Um, CORE is currently working with CalSTART, our administrator. Uh, the current process to participate depends on if you're a manufacturer, dealer, or equipment owner, and each have their own participation steps. So we'll go through each one uh, quickly. Again, this is high level. Uh, you can always ask questions on how to 
participate uh, through uh, CalStart or you can contact me. But for manufacturers, um, read and understand the core implementation manual. That's uh, very important. Uh, second of all, complete and compile documents outlined in, in attachment A. And attachment A is the core equipment eligibility application. This includes the manufacturer and equipment information and acquired programmatic information. Then you would send this com uh, complete application package to core at arb.ca.gov. Also, uh, work and advise your dealers to enroll in the core, which leads us to dealers. Uh, for dealers, review the training manual material, such as the implementation manual, voucher funding tables, voucher request instructions, and voucher redemption checklist. Then email to info at californiacore.org regarding your interest in becoming a core approved dealer. There's a core dealer training quiz. You must pass this quiz with a score of 100%. In addition, you have dealers must submit the following material to CalStart, a dealer registration form and a Department of Treasury IRS W-9 form. Okay, for equipment owners wanting to participate in this program, um, really any off-road equipment user in California is eligible. Users must be domiciled and operate for at least three years in California. Users must submit activity reports for three years. Select equipment that suits your needs from the online catalog. And uh, right now the core webpage has a list of equipment that's, that's on there. Uh, contact your affiliated vendors. Uh, they are trained. They took the test and passed by 100% uh, to apply for core and process the core voucher. Provide the vendor with the equipment domicile location and other information and purchase your core discounted equipment through your dealer. Slide number 10. So next steps, uh, to kind of give you an idea where we're heading. Uh, we plan to have another work group in the early spring to further refine ideas we're providing today. We'd like to re release updated information on the implementation manual later this spring. We'd like to open the voucher in, in early to midsummer. Today's topic is not covering landscaping equipment for small business or sole proprietors. Uh, that will be on a slightly different track uh, with upcoming work groups in April. Uh, and we'd like to open the vouchers in late to summer. So <clears throat> slide number 11, that was, that was a quite a bit of information. Uh, my name is Todd Sterling. Here's some contacts that I, I mentioned during the presentation. Uh, California Core is uh, the webpage for uh, CalStart. Uh, information goes to CalStart there. Uh, my name is Todd Sterling. Here's my email address. Uh, you can email me with comments and questions that you have um, if you think of them you know, during this meeting or, or after this meeting. Um, so let's open up for questions and, and comments. Um, again, I'll kind of go through this one more time. I will ask that you raise your hand to let us know that you have a question or comment. Um, Emirate will then unmute your line. For those of you participating by phone, please press pound two to raise your hand and state your name and affiliation. Okay. So, Amrit, do we have, have any questions? We don't have any raised hands. Okay. Oh, we've, we've got a couple, okay. Give me just a second. Um, if you are um, raising your hand, I will announce your name and unmute your line. Um, then please introduce yourself and state your name and affiliation. So we're gonna start off with John Del Arose. Good morning, John. Morning. I, have... um, I work with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and I just wanted to provide a comment for those listening on the line. Um, we have a Volkswagen zero emission freight and marine program that's open now that covers many of the same categories as core. Support cargo handling equipment and, and heavy duty forklifts, including uh, as well as marine harbor craft. This program is open now and closes on March 22nd. So please get in contact if you are interested. Um, I will provide a link in the chat if uh, the moderators can provide that to the team. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. We can, we can do that. If you put that information in the, in the chat, I think if we answer it, it goes out to everybody.
All right. Uh, next raise hand we have is from Terry Maines. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Terry Mannies, and I am with Orange EV. We manufacture electric terminal trucks. And I'm curious about the list where we see that terminal trucks are in their own category. And then further down, there's an agricultural equipment category. If a terminal truck is operating in a agricultural environment, is it, would it be funded as a terminal truck or would it be funded as a piece of ag equipment? Well, that's a good question. What we can, we really don't want the equipment operator to, to worry about that, right? We can, and, and we have these uh, categories determined by funding sources. So, so uh, they would just apply for their uh, terminal tractor, whether they're a, you know, a, a nut producer or, or work at a, a, you know, at a port of terminal rail yard. And then we would pull from the correct category. So, so if you have a terminal tractor that that you know moves nuts or or fruit, then then we pull it from the uh, agricultural category. Oh, okay, awesome! Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, we have a raised hand from Eric Swanson. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Hi, yes, this is uh, Eric Swanson and I'm with Calmar Terminal Tractors. Uh, if you could verify, I think the last uh, meeting you were saying that the uh, amount of funding for uh, the terminal tractors was was going to be based on a power rating of 160 kilowatts, um, and then if the power was less than that, it, it would uh, the amount would get decreased. Um, if you could verify that, we'd really like to see the power rating uh, at something less than the 160 kilowatt. I'd suggest 150 kilowatt um, as kind of the, the benchmark amount. Um, also, the if you, if you just, uh, if I caught it correctly, you said the minimum amount is going to be $100,000 per terminal tractor. We as a manufacturer have not yet seen costs of components going down. Um, so that means that the end user is going to have to pay more uh, out of pocket for the uh, truck if I think the incentive amounts previously were uh, one and a half times or more that amount uh, of the hundred thousand dollars. So uh, the, the end user is going to have to see have to pay more out of pocket. That's all. Right. Okay. So, so your question about the kilowatts, um, could, could you explain that to me just a little bit more? I, I think the, at least for Calmar, okay, I think our minimum uh, previously was 132 kilowatts. Most of what was sold was 176. We're, we're, we're modifying the truck or, or kind of coming out with a phase two now, if you want. It's going to be um, the, the kilowatt power is going to be less than the 160 kilowatts that I believe last time you mentioned was the uh, benchmark for receiving an incentive. Um, so I guess uh, th this benchmark amount, 160 kilowatts, I guess is what I'd like to discuss. You can't lower the, the rated power. So, so Eric, the, um, the way the implementation manual reads now is that it's 160 kilowatt uh, hours or less. 
So everything below that would get the same amount. It's just a, it's just a boundary between the voucher amount. Okay, maybe not about maybe eligibility. You you are you are eligible even if you're less than one hundred and sixty. Okay, okay, maybe I didn't quite understand that. I was I was interpreting it that uh, if you were below the one hundred and sixty kW, then you'd get less than the hundred thousand dollar minimum amount. Well, we can still have discussions about that, yeah. especially if the components, because that that part of it. So I thought it was eligibility of yes or no versus how much. So is that your yeah. comment? Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my comment. And I guess a, a second follow-up comment is the, the component component cost, we're we're not yet seeing a mm -hmm. uh, cost reduction in component costs. As you, you mentioned that the terminal tractors is a more mature product. And while that might may be true, we're not seeing a component cost reduction yet. Mm -hmm. So the end user is going to have to pay more out of pocket if you're reducing the if the minimum amount is a hundred thousand dollar, you know, incentive amount. Right. Well, we'd love to hear and get more information from from you and Kalmar um, on on the costs. And how, how we can how we can balance that because we want to balance it so we can get the most yard trucks out into California, like the zero emission yard trucks that we can, uh, but still not not pay too much for that, right? So so right. it is it is an incentive, right? It's not going to pay for the whole thing or or cover the cost, but we want to spread it out as, as much as we can. And so what's that that balance point, right? And so if you can provide us more information um, to help us with that, that'd be that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a raised hand from Dave Cook. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Um, yeah, David Cook with Real Propulsion Systems. I was going to comment on the time period. Uh, we would prefer, at least for the rail car and switchers, that it, it go for nine months, as this is a newer category with uh, much smaller units. So uh, if they open up the categories to if they close off the funding and give the funding away too fast, you'll get less switchers and rail car movers um, out for that category. And that was my comment on that. And I wondered okay, if we're going to talk about the different uh, voucher amount. We, we, can, we can talk about the voucher amounts right now if you'd like. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't see any slides that, that talked about the, how you were integrating the, rail, the switchers and the rail car movers. So I'm just curious what you guys, your initial thoughts are. Well, I think if you go back to slide um, seven or eight, I think, you're talking about, I think that was switches and, and uh, rail car movers were included in that. Um, right, and, and in rail car movers, there are different voucher levels for different performance equipment and switcher locomotives would be even higher performance than rail car movers, they cost more, so I just, I didn't know if you guys had a draft of how you were proposing the different uh, amounts in that category and if there was going to be plus ups for batteries and another subject I don't want to dominate this thing uh, inductive charging is something you know we've been interested in and and was talked about before right so so for as far as voucher amounts right um we, we look, I mean, these are, are almost one-offs, right? I, I, I'm guessing, I mean, you're not, you're not producing you know, hundreds of these like, like, like yard trucks. So we would look at the, the cost differential, right? And come up with a voucher amount like, like we have in the past for you know, other pieces of equipment. Okay. And as far as um, infrastructure, you know, all, all of these pieces of equipment need infrastructure. That's, that's a given, right? Is we can't just go to the diesel pump and fill up anymore. Um, this program mainly focuses on uh, vehicles and, and off-road pieces of equipment. Um, we do offer some, you know, plus up and some help for, for infrastructure. Uh, but, you know, as you know, pieces get larger and, and it gets more expensive, um, I don't think this is really the, uh, the, 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 
program that that's really going to help um, you know uh, with 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 the with the infrastructure. I mean, it'll help, but it's not that that program that there's more for vehicles and equipment. Okay, thanks. That that answers it. And it sounds like the voucher amounts is more of an offline discussion where we give you guys some more information. More information is always helpful. Thank you. We have a raised hand from Rebecca Lee. You have been unmuted. Hi, thank you for can you, uh, thank you for the workshop. So um, so I, my name is Rebecca Lee and I, here I represent um, Goal Zero, which is a manufacturer of small, um, you know, their small off-road, their small zero emission off-road equipment. So I read in the 21-22 um, the funding plan that um, staff is planning to make um, zero emission small off-road equipment, a general eligible category. Um, so I just want to clarify, is that like, like, is that part of today's conversation for the, for the small SOAR or is that limited to the, um, the 30 million set aside for um, lawn equipment under SB 170? So that's just something I just trying to figure out if that's will be a focus today's discussion no yeah that i missed that during the, the presentation while it, it is a category for for core this this uh funding cycle um this meeting is not going to cover uh landscape equipment that would be it's on a little different track there's a little different timing um so um if you would reach out and uh, provide me your contact information i'll make sure that uh you're in in the uh in line for for that and make sure you sign up for the core uh uh, go dove uh, gov delivery uh, service. Uh, maybe that's where you received this uh, email already. But um, it, yes, uh, landscape equipment for like sword type equipment. Um, that we'll have a different workshop just for that. It's a different topic and uh, it's on a different, different, little bit different timeline. Sure. Uh, so the follow up then, my follow. Thank, thank you for that uh, response. My follow up question is that. So is is small soar then is it not an eligible technology category in the general soar is it only limited to the landscaping um component right so so the sp170 provided uh 30 million dollars for uh soar equipment and we're putting that in the, in the professional landscapers for sole proprietors or uh, small businesses okay so thank you for that that's what's um that is thank you so because i was confused by this because of the language in the the funding plan the overall 21 22 funding plan for um yeah for new equipment so so definitely welcome the opportunity to have a offline conversation with you thank you Super. thank you thank you we have another raised hand by ariel cabrera Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Hi, yeah, this is Ariel Cabrera with Conductix Wampler. Um, we uh, make electrification equipment for uh, various equipment, but specifically RTGs uh, in this case. So my question is related to that. And I, I think uh, in part, it may have been answered uh, relating to slide number six um, in the equipment. Um, you just mentioned that uh, it's more for vehicles and not equipment. So I just want to make sure that uh, specifically RTGs are not included in this uh, opportunity, correct? Well, let's let's go. If we go back to the slide, uh, Amrit, sorry to make you go back one more time to to the um, equipment list. I think it was slide number uh, six. seven, six. So. RTG cranes. 
And then I could see it didn't really fit any of those categories. And that's kind of what has me asking here. Yeah. We, um, you know, I will say uh, this is that the, if you look at the previous categories, there was advanced cargo handling equipment and that's where RTG cranes would fit. And that might've, I'm not sure how that relates relative to large forklifts. There might've been an intersection there. So there might be a little bit of a misnomer, but RTG cranes, if it meets all, if it's commercially ready and if there's zero emission technology available, I definitely wanna see how we can include them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a raised hand from Robert Brown. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Brown and I'm with Everport Terminal Services. So I'm an end user. Uh, just got a couple questions. Uh, I Someone was asking about the voucher amounts and, I, not under, when, and when you say a, a 100K is the minimum, is that is that the maximum or minimum what do you mean by minimum uh, 100k on the voucher amount for uh tractors so so for for yard tractors uh the the voucher amounts varied in the, in the first round and uh we, we 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 purchased quite a few of those in the in the category filled up uh, quickly so our question was were, were we paying too much for the for yard tractors uh right we were offering too much of an incentive for yard tractors since they so fast and, and uh, instead of uh, raising the voucher amount, and I think the voucher amounts vary from, you know, 140 to 160 around in there, maybe we just have a voucher amount at, at $100,000 for a yard truck. That way uh, we're still offering a great incentive, right, $100,000. And also uh, we can purchase more yard trucks to go into California. Okay. So, so um, like I was telling the previous caller, we're trying to find that, that correct level where you know, we're not paying too much, right? So, so, and and we can still use that uh, funding to to purchase more yard trucks in, in California. Okay. Um, so back to the advanced cargo handling equipment and whether you uh, will uh, support or give a voucher on our RTG. How about uh, top handlers, top loaders, that, that sort of thing? Uh, right. So, so yeah. cargo handling equipment is is an eligible category. Um, we didn't call it out specifically on the list, but but it is an eligible category. So you know, top picks, side picks, um, RTG cranes are, are eligible categories. Um, I'm sorry I didn't include that on the list, but but it, it is an eligible category. Okay. Yeah, they had been included relative to the large forklifts, so they're in that same sort of uh, equipment category batch. So if certainly if they're commercially available and if there's an interested purchaser, even more, we should have a discussion. Okay, I just got two more questions. Uh, I'm not sure, are, are you in a, a funding cycle right now that is current and it's too late to get in this current funding cycle? Or, or is there another funding cycle that's coming up later that uh, this uh, workshop is referring to? Right, that's a great question. So the, the previous, so we've, the core has gone through one funding cycle already. So we funded you know, hundreds of pieces of equipment. Um, that is now done. Right, so that's that's closed off. This is for the new funding cycle. So the, the original funding cycle was for freight movement only. Uh, this funding cycle includes freight movement plus includes other categories, like I mentioned earlier, uh, construction and ag, um, and 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 uh, like commercial uh, commercial aircraft things like that. So this is for the new funding cycle. Uh, we're right now we're going through the public process of um, making sure that you know we're offering the right amounts, like we talked about earlier making sure that the implementation manual uh, is reflecting uh, the issues and, and updates to issues that we had in the first round to make it clear and work better for everybody. And then uh, we'll open up the vouchers again for this round um, in early to, to mid-summer. Uh, summer 2022. Summer 2022, yes, yes. Okay, yes. when you, say you open it up, that's for, for, uh, for applications voucher applications for voucher applications and for me as an end user i would have to go through either my manufacturer or my dealer right yes right go through your dealer right okay 
So, so what we're looking for here, Robert, is for you, for the dealers that you have, vendors that you have relationships with, I need you to talk to them about like, how do they participate and become a part of the core program so that you can buy their equipment, that they would be an eligible piece of equipment. So, um, and then all of this round of development till the next implementation manual update is, is off of the funding plan that uh, was adopted in November, 2021. Okay. And if the funding cycle opens up for in some, summer of 2022, when will the vouchers be funded? They'll be ready to funded yes. uh, just, just after that. I mean, we have everything in line and, and yeah. just about ready to go now. Oh, okay. So as, as soon as, yeah, that, that, that should work. As soon as possible, yeah. So yeah. It, it's, the, the, the way it works for voucher applications is there's a voucher application, there's a review for it, there's approval. Once you're approved as the, as the purchaser, then there's a commitment to build. And so you, the purchases, we'll, we'll get a purchase order at that time. So okay. the transaction continues. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you have- and that, goes on, that goes on until all the money is gone okay. for, this, for this round. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's all my questions. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, for the, uh, the workshop and answering my questions. You're welcome. If you have any further questions, uh, you know, my email is right here. Um, reach out and we can help you out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a raised hand from Ellis Chi. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. You're still unmuted. I mean, sorry, you're still muted, Ellis. Just gotta hit the red icon to unmute maybe yourself. They, maybe they stepped away. Yeah, well, why don't we go ahead and try to do some of the Q&A questions. Um, I think there was quite a few and I'd like to get those um, addressed. Yes, I'd be happy to start that off. The first one was is from Eric Strike. If a dealer was registered on the prior core program, do they need to take the test and register again? I confirmed with CalStart on this question, our program administrator, and they indicated that no, a dealer does not need to retake the test. There will be updated terms and conditions and voucher request forms that they will need to receive in order to voucher requests in the near future so all dealers are encouraged to stay signed up for the email distribution list and our program minister will be on touch regarding the next steps in terms of paperwork the next question is from amy kumel do existing dealers and manufacturers have to reapply or do we move to the approve list automatically so in terms of dealers, uh, they, they stay in the approval list, as I stated previously, just they need to have updated terms and conditions and voucher request forms. Manufacturers eligibility applications uh, do sunset after one year currently. And many manufacturers who are previously eligible have already started the conversation about reapplying. So that is the requirements of the program at present. The, the only caveat that I would add to that, Matt, is given the fact that we're going through the public process now of updating the implementation manual, is that if there's any requirements that change for a dealer that might be reflected in the grants terms and conditions, and there might be uh, additional questions or just making sure that the awareness of that change is uh, made to the dealer. So I just wanted to clarify. Yes. And for manufacturers that are currently going through the process of applying you know, I can accept an application today, but if there are additional requirements when we publish the final implementation manual in the weeks and months to come, uh, there may be additional information asked for those applications before they're finalized. The next question comes from uh, Man Alther. This question asks, please define heavy duty. In general, we define heavy duty as a, a zero, for the purpose of this program, as a piece of equipment that is equivalent to greater than 25 horsepower equivalent. Uh, that has historically been our defining you know, horsepower threshold between 
uh, light duty and heavy duty for the off-road space or small off-road engines and large rather. Okay, the next question is from Cindy Rosa. How can we get more information on being an approved manufacturer for forklifts? Actually, this is my first webinar and I would like as much information on forklifts as possible and don't know where to start, can you direct? Cindy, I'd be happy to you know, chat with you offline, but to answer your, and provide you more information. Um, in general, uh, manufacturers, uh, who have the final design control over equipment are eligible to apply to the program. Uh, we're currently only opening this program to zero emission equipment. So typically this is battery and fuel cell powered equipment. If you want to apply, uh, please reach out to me or Todd and we can direct you to the current implementation manual. This is an existing category. So you would be eligible to start the application process. Right now, we are funding forklifts that have greater than 8,000 pound lift capacity only. Next question is from Doran Milbaum. If I have a customer that enters a demo agreement that is agreed upon for the next four months and they would like to procure at the end of demo, can they use core funding for procurement? Demo begins before vouchers are available and as part of their justification for purchase. I'm sorry, I'm confused about who's funding the demo. And is the demo finished or is that a prototype that the purchaser is using from the manufacturer? Amber, would you be able to unmute Doran so you can provide clarification on this? Yeah. Just a second. Uh, Dorn, you have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak. Can you we, we, we could hear you, yes. Okay. Um, so this is uh, a piece of equipment um, that is commercially available now. Uh, it's an airline that we would like to uh, put in their operation. Right now, in San Francisco, as they're looking to procure fossil fuel. Um, so they're looking to see if they can start a dental period um, in the next two weeks or so. And we have to move on now 120 hours to take dental period. Um, once proof of concept is proven to them, um, at that time they decide to procure and go to that client to take more about your thing. So when it's a brand new piece of equipment, it's a new client machine is going. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, Doran, it was a little bit tough to hear you, but if I interpret this correctly, you have a, a customer who you're looking to start a demo with within the next couple of weeks and that you're looking to see if, if this demo is successful with this customer, that that piece of equipment could be funded under the eligibility uh, as a core application. I don't recall if we have a minimum or a threshold for the number of hours for a piece of equipment that's to call it eligible. I don't recall if we had that in the current implementation manual. That's something that we can think about defining if, it, if that is something that we should be reflective of, of manufacturers putting a, a product in the hands of customers as they look to try before they buy. Um, so I don't know if we would, I'd have to double check in our implementation mail if this would be allowable. And if it's something we want to consider, we can look at some language to potentially consider that. Yeah. yeah, and Dorn, was, you're really difficult to hear. So maybe maybe we could talk offline or just contact me. Uh, we can set up a meeting to just discuss your specific uh, situation. I think that would be helpful for everybody. Um, for the next question, I'll, I'll answer live. Uh, this is from Greg Herner. Uh, what is the specific percentage of each category that uh, must go to a DAC? Um, you are planning to re redefine our, you are 
you're you're planning to redefine a DAC or using DAC categories under the virus screen. There's there's no specific percentage that were required to go to a DAC. We we like a lot of the equipment to go to DACs because um, of the, the the burden that they have, um, and and we're hoping that you know having a plus up for uh, small businesses operating in a disadvantaged community would would help that. Also. Um, Many of the piece of equipment uh, in these categories operate at freight and intermodal rail yards, which are typically in disadvantaged communities already. So, so just with those two things, um, I think a higher percentage uh, would go to a disadvantaged community. Now, how we define the disadvantaged community, um, we have a lot of work to do here just to get vouchers going. Uh, uh, we're relying on Calavirus screen. Uh, the, the newest version uh, 4.0 to, to define what that category would be. Yeah. So that's that's uh, uh, answering your question there. So, so the the other thing too is that the, we prioritize DACs by offering um, plus ups for that, and there's requirements with that where there's a certain amount of operation that should be happening in this advantaged community. So that's the portion that you should be looking for in the current implementation manual, um, and the update to that would be like um, Todd had mentioned, an update to the Calenviro screen model that's being used to define a DAC location. Matt, you want, do you want to take Thomas Lester's question? Or um Actually, I'm sorry, I wanted to add a little bit more to the DACs because I wanted to figure out like um, some of the discussion that you had primed up, Todd, was whether or not we should have a wait list or a lottery or a contingency list and how long and how that ha and the process with which. One of the things that I thought we had been considering too is maybe prioritizing um, small businesses or DACs, that's what we need feedback on relative to the voucher applications received during the funding cap, but also on the contingency list, you know, to kind of make, you know, how do we feel about making those a priority? You know, right, and right. The and I'm, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear in the presentation, but um, what we're thinking is if, if a category fills, right? So mm -hmm. for example, I, I don't know if it will or not, but saying yard, yard truck fills up in, in the specified time amount that we that we come up with, like we said, either four, six or nine months. So it fills up. Um, Operators that are small business op small businesses and operating a DAC would move to the top of the list, and then op operators in a DAC would move below them, and then uh, the remainder of the list would would be filled. So, so that would make sure that you know folks that are small businesses operating a DAC um, would would get funded for for their vouchers. But again, this is just ideas. We like to hear feedback. On, on what folks think about that. Okay. Uh, do you want to take the next question here, or would you like me to? Oh, I, I, okay. I, I saw that you you. Gonna, I'd like to answer the question, so I thought you were. But uh, let me read through it and. Um, uh, this is a question from uh, Thomas Lester. Uh, you stated that voucher amounts for each of the nine categories would be 13.8 million each. Assuming each one is below 160 kilowatt hours, that would be 138 trucks at $100,000 $100, each. Last time there was a waiting list of more than 100 trucks. Is, is there plans to expand on that after the first two or three months or pull? From other categories. Well, let me just answer that part right now. So, so we we uh, this is our plan, right? So, so this we're thinking at at twenty percent per category. Uh, that's about thirteen point eight million. So, if it fills up, uh, and uh, then uh, other categories, say the other eight categories don't fill up, the money would then be dispersed again and, and spread out to to uh, and open up for all the categories. So it would limit it to 138 trucks in the in the first go round, but then uh, potentially expand out to more. Um, but on the other, side, all the categories fill up, then that would be the the uh, the max, right? 
Um, so, so to answer, the, let's, let's read the second part of your question. Um, also, previously, the kilowatt hours of the truck granted the application with a higher amount for the higher kilowatt per hour truck. For example, a 132 kilowatt hour Kalmar rebate was 150K, 176 was 156, and 220 kilowatt hour uh, was uh, 174K. Would that be the same this time around, or are we limiting the rebates to either 100K or 150K? Um, like I said in my presentation, we're, we're thinking about limiting the VR truck to $100,000 uh, for, for, for a couple of reasons. One, the, the VR truck category filled up quickly last go around. Uh, this is, and, and we want to limit that. And, and uh, were we paying too much? Maybe we're paying too much and uh, fill up very quickly. Uh, and by limiting the amount, maybe we could get some more yard trucks into California and operating in, in different areas in California. So is that the right amount? Uh, we'd like to hear more feedback from, from you and uh, uh, what you think the correct amount is. Not just feedback, but but data would, would also help. Um, hope that answers your question, Thomas. If, if not, you can always reach out to me and uh, we can talk about this offline. So the, so the next question is, okay, let me answer that one already. Todd, do you want to take this one regarding the, the discussion you had regarding a letter of intent versus a purchase order in hand? Right. So the question uh, reads, uh, was it mentioned that the LOI is sufficient to secure the voucher in lieu of PO in hand? Uh, and the customer would then, would then have a certain time of period to get the funding set. Will it freeze the funds for that specific purchase? I think that is the intent, right? And instead of having a PO in hand, a letter of intent would kind of hold that voucher in place and, until things, uh, the wheels of, uh, whatever government process or the process uh, you have uh, would 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 uh, uh, provide the funding. I like I like that only also because the purchaser already is using the unit is already built, and the purchaser is already using it. So we even though we might have like a it's just trading the time frames between uh, once a purchase order gets approved, then um, there's build time for that. But now we're just kind of like trading that with a later a letter of intent versus the build time. So I think that that does meet the intent of what we're trying to do here. Core is intended to um, support the market shift to zero emission across all equipment categories. And that's why we're trying to figure out all of the various policies and how they might intersect across the industries that have uh, equipment types. So, so we'll put that down as a comment, but we, I definitely like it. All right, the next question comes from Carolyn Delcor. Will mining trucks be considered in the future funding? If yes, what is the timeline? Thank you. So in general, I, thank you for this question, Caroline. I think in general, we could look at this category to potentially fit under the construction category of off-road equipment that we're proposing to be eligible as was indicated in the, the presentation and in our write-up for the funding plan. Uh, we're still looking at, you know, voucher amount caps of $500,000 currently per piece of eligible equipment. Uh, if you have any uh, manufacturers in mind, we'd be more than happy to discuss to see what products are commercially available today for potential inclusion in the program. I think to add on top of that, um, would depending on, on the, the situation, if the, the mining truck may be uh, required to be all, all zero emission, if that's the case, then we would have to think about that a little more deeply also. In, in terms of timeline, uh, currently this category is proposed but not written into the implementation manual. So we can have discussions to better understand what is the state of technology and commercial readiness. Uh, we will be looking to add this as an eligible category with appropriate metrics in the weeks and months to come. Once that implementation is finalized, then an eligible manufacturer could apply to the program 
And then subsequently they could request vouchers on behalf of a customer. The next question comes from Brianna Lawrence. Quick, quick clarification regarding the streamlining of voucher amounts for yard tractors. Did I hear correctly that this would mean that the yard tractor voucher amounts will decrease? If so, by how much? Todd, would you like to reiterate the, the point you made earlier on this? Yeah, so so we're, we're looking at streamlining the uh, yard truck's uh, voucher amount to $100,000. Um, we had some back and forth with a couple of different manufacturers on this already. Um, is it that is that the right amount? And uh, if you don't think that's the correct amount, we like to get some data from from uh, you all to uh, help us come up with the right the right amount. We would like, uh, yeah, my my goal to spend this money uh, as as efficiently as possible and get the most yard trucks into California as we can. Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. But uh, more data that we have, the better. So if you can help us out with that, Brianna, that that'd be uh, really appreciated. Thank you, Todd. And question from Man Altaher. Can a core participant also participate in the low carbon fuel standard program, meaning the off-road zero emission vehicle purchased through core, can it get LCF credits? I don't know that any of our previous participants have also looked to participate in the LCFS program. I'm not aware of any restrictions that they would have. You know, I don't believe that the core would preclude them from. Um, feel free to reach out. We can connect you with an appropriate LCFS program staff to determine if the equipment category uh, that you're looking at or a customer is looking at is eligible and what that process would be. Okay, I can take this next one. This is from uh, Bang Low. Are you aware of programs to apply for lighter duty forklifts? Uh, another program here in California that goes through your air district is uh, the car motor program. And you should contact your air district uh, to help you fund um, lighter duty uh, forklifts. That's a great, great question. And then, So Dave Cook, 50% uh, small business and DAC, do they have to be combined or can half be used if only one criteria is met? Well, we haven't, um, the, the small business and DAC 15% plus up, we haven't you know, set in stone yet, um, but that's, that's an idea that we came up with. We'd like to hear your feedback. Um, we haven't thought about combining or, or doing half. What we're thinking right now is that um, small businesses are already uh, having a tough time, uh, and especially if they operate in a disadvantaged community, and offering a 50% plus up would, would definitely help them. Um, so, you know, if you have more information on, on why we should and shouldn't combine or half the criteria being met, I'd um, love to hear from that. Um, so, and, and what do you think of that idea? So, love to hear more from you from Dave, from that Dave. Oh, and Dave Cook's next, next question also. So we'll just go right into that one. Which Cal Enviral parameter and what is the minimum percentage to become a DAC? Um, that is a, a Cal Enviral uh, question. Um, I can reach out to uh, who, I forget who the uh... Todd. I Todd. This is Michelle Buffington. I'll um, type the name of the person who uh, okay for someone whom he can contact. The Perfect. the disadvantaged community requirements are not set by this particular program. They're set they're set by the um, Cal EPA um, and then certified by by a team a, a different team here at CARP. So David, you can use some contact um, information for that. Thank you, Michelle. I was, I was searching in my mind for the uh, video that, that covers Cal Enviro screen. So uh, next question from Scott Morrison. 
uh, is there a list of approved vendors for zero emission qualified for this program for construction equipment? Well, construction equipment is a, is a new category. So we're, we're you know, having these meetings to reach out and uh, you know, reach out to, to vendors and to manufacturers to get on the list. Um, like I said in my presentation earlier, if you're, if you're interested, reach out to, you can reach out to me. I'll get you to contact the right folks. I can reach out to um, our, uh, uh, to with, with the first folks we work with at CalStart and they can also help you. So if you're interested, uh, contact me and we'll get you um, heading down the road to get on the list. Uh, next question is from uh, Amy Kumel. Uh, can you please clarify how the infrastructure process will work moving forward? Will it be paid direct to the end customer, the property owner, property own, I'm guessing owner, and not be given as a discount to the dealer invoice? Um, that's a good question. We'll look for your feedback. Um, I know mm, we had a, a couple instances in the first round that, that this was an issue. Um, so um, your feedback would be would be uh, valuable. So um, what you think would be best and, and the easiest way for us to uh, get the voucher out to the right folks. And so it could be um, uh, not held up for um, you know paperwork or because it's the wrong customer or whatever, um, that would be uh, valuable. So Amy, if you could get back to us, that, that would be great. Um, next question is from uh, Mark Zwinner. Um, how soon can voucher request? Another great question. Matt, what, what do you think? So in terms of voucher requests? Yeah, voucher requests are going to be. Man, um, dealers and manufacturers submitting voucher requests on behalf of customers will, I believe you messaged Todd, in the be in the summer period. For the program in, in general we won't be able to open up the voucher applications until the manufacturer's uh, so eligibility list is determined so the manufacturers have to apply and get evaluated first and that would happen after the implementation manual is updated okay thank, thank you guys um dave cook just to clarify DAC credit is only for equipment used in DAC, not for small businesses located in DAC. Well, we're, we're still working that out, Dave. So, so what we're proposing is to offer a 50% plus up for small businesses operating in a DAC. Um, that's, that's where we're at right now. Again, if you have uh, some clarification or, or um, have some ideas, we're, 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 our ears are open. So uh, from Terry uh, Main, Mainies, I'm sorry if I, if I messed up your name. Uh, can a PO still be used or is an LOI, LOI mandatory? No, a PO can still be used. Um, what we ran into the first round was um, in some cases uh, for government entities and sometimes when people were stacking with other programs, um, they could not issue a PO at that time, but so a letter of intent would, would be used. Uh, that's what we're proposing. So, um, so PO still works. Uh, letter of intent would not be mandatory. So we have just a couple of the questions here, and then I don't, I can't see the. Um, I guess I can see participants. We have a couple of hands raised. So let, let's try to answer uh, these questions. Then we could go to raise hands. Uh, this is from uh, Gianna. Covello, uh, will you be opening up the crow bank for lighter, lighter duty forklifts? We have 6,000 pound forklifts. At this time, um, I think the smallest forklift is of 8,000 pound capacity. Uh, smaller forklifts have been zero emission or had zero emission offerings for many years. So uh, uh, this program is, is trying to put some technology uh, and into the larger forklifts. So that's, that's where the program's at right now. 
Uh, next question is from Dion Van Levy. Uh, when do OEMs have, the, have to submit completed for review and approved for the core brand? When do OEMs have to submit? Um, you can submit your, your information right now. Um, you can send your information to me and I'll get it to the right folks. Uh, my email address is up there right now. So that helps you out there. Uh, another question from Dan Cook. Can the core team release current draft implementation matter before each of the upcoming meetings? Um, that's a good idea. I don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, the, the current implementation manual is, is up right now on the core webpage. Um, you can look at that. Um, these updates, um, whether or not super extensive, um you know we went through the, the in the meeting today but uh uh yeah we, we can we can probably do something like that okay so that's for the q a portion amrit do we have some more raised hands yeah we do we have a raised hand from robert brown okay. uh, you've been unmuted please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to uh, hit the uh, that button. So for, forgive me. I, I don't have a question. Oh, we'd love to hear from you, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. Todd, there are no raised hands at this time. OK, thank you. I'm right. Sorry, actually, we have we have one right now. <laughs> Give me okay. one second. So we've got a raised hand from Terry Manny's. You have been unmuted. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, it's Terry Manny's again from, <clears throat> excuse me, Orange GV. And I have a question about um, when, when you say that you're looking at prioritizing small businesses and or companies operating in DACs, does that mean only after like only after the initial period ends and you've moved on to the wait list or will you be, will you be prioritizing those from the minute that the applications open? Does, is, does that make sense? Well, this, this, is, this is what we're thinking right now, that when the uh, voucher uh, rope drops, right? And then we right. open it up for that specified time, say it's it six months. I'm just, okay. just throwing a throwing a date out there, and and the uh, yard truck category fills in, in one month, right? And in that in that grouping of of one month of, for yard trucks is 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 um, folks that operate in, in the Central Valley and ADAC and their small businesses, they will get moved to the top of that list, um, and then uh, to to ensure that they they get funded. Then and then, uh, folks that operate an attack would would be on there, and then um, everybody else operating in California. Okay, so in other words, no no decisions could be made then on funding until the until the category had completely closed, because it's only after a category closes that you can look and see where all of the applicants are located and who they are, what kind of business they are. Am I correct in that? No, I, I think that what the part that's hard is for yard trucks where they filled up so quickly, it's really a point of issue once the funding cap gets reached. And so and since we're talking about small businesses and um, especially in DACs, their purchase order wouldn't be like, it's not gonna be one transaction. It'll be one unit, one transaction, maybe a couple more than that. So. So it only becomes an issue as we approach that funding cap. So, cause I think that's what your question is, right, Terry? I think that we, you know, we'll, we'll take that all into consideration with voucher approval. Once the voucher approval is given, then the order's good to go. Right, yeah, I guess, I mean, because it's terminal tractors, let's just assume we're gonna have the same kind of situation we did last time. It's gonna fill up super fast. One day, yeah. <laughs> oh, that long? Yeah. Um, okay, so once it's filled up, then you will look at the totality of the applications that came in and prioritize based on the kind of business they are and where they're located. 
I think that that is absolutely true in that kind of situation. The part that I was talking about is if it takes I, uh, if 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 say that the first few orders are only half of the funding cap, you know why are we, there's no reason for us to wait at that time for that first come first serve. We might as well give the the voucher approval at that time. Once you okay. have the voucher, once you have the voucher approval, we're not going to take that back. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. understand. Yeah. Okay. So we're so we're not going to wait till the very very end. But if it happens in one day, that might be the case. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. That just, yeah. You just never know. But if it, because my thing is, is, I wouldn't want somebody who's willing to go today to wait till the end of the six months or nine months or whatever we wind up choosing to be able to proceed. Yeah. So, but I mean, yeah. realistically, we, we all kind of know that's not going to happen in yard trucks. It won't that take for yard trucks. Trucks. Yes. Yes. Right. This, which is one of the reasons that we are looking to try to figure out how to standardize that voucher uh, amount. Right. Yes. To totally understood. Okay. So then that, well, you know what? I think I'll contact you guys offline with some questions because then okay. that, that, that gets into how you advise your customers who are interested in, you know, in applying for these. So yes. I will, all right, I'll, I'll circle back. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. We have a, another raised hand from Nick Chase. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Good morning. My name is Nick Chase. I am with Bolt House Farms in Bakersfield. I'm an end user of terminal tractors. Um, based on what I'm hearing so far, it sounds like the uh, voucher amount for terminal tractors is definitely going to change. And it sounds like $100,000 is the, the direction you're leaning. At what point will that final amount or the final decision be made on that amount? And um, and when and then a, a secondary question is: Would the number of hours that a zero emission vehicle is uh, used per uh, year will that ever become a factor in the decision on uh, awarding a voucher? Um, Nick, two two great questions. I don't I don't know if we've definitely decided on the voucher amount, but th those are some ideas that we have, and kind of the, the uh, you know having a set voucher amount for terminal tractors or yard goats or whatever we want to call them. Um, so so um, that's not set in stone, but that may be the direction we're we're moving. But I'd like to hear more ideas from, from you if if you think that's that's wrong. Um, uh, your second part of your question was, if you just, just. Sure. It was, would, would the, uh, uh, the, the usage, um, you know, the, usage, the number right, of right, hours right. be, uh, ever be part of the decision, just like a uh, DAC or a small business, uh, because we're highly utilizing our terminal tractors. Obviously the, the, the more hours that you're using a zero emission vehicle, the, the, the greater um, emissions reductions there are. Right, so would right. that ever be a part of the equation when it comes to awarding the vouchers? Yeah, so this is the tough part for me, uh, Nick, on that is that um, we're trying to help support the facilitation, the shift of market for the whole zero emission technology in the off-road space. Yard Tractors is a great starter. It's done very well, just like the lower lift capacity forklifts, um, which is a little bit more mature. But I think the implementation manual is certainly going to be one that'll be whatever decisions are made that once that gets finalized, that'll be very clear um, on your question for the changing of the or prioritizing usage. The only reason that we have the minimum usage is we're trying to empower the purchaser because because it, in, unless the demand is there, then we, we you know, we can't figure out how to do this. But the minimum usage is reflective of the diversity of all off-road equipment from rail car movers to yard trucks to now we're trying to figure out eventually leaf blowers. So, so, so those are the, all the consideration points that we have in that. So, but thank you. I'll, I'll take your comment, comment into consideration if we're gonna wind up doing a, uh, some sort of prioritization based on usage. To me, that leads to a different policy discussion to be quite honest, yeah. Understood, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I don't see any more raised hands right now. There's a couple of other questions in the Q&A we can jump into. Well, the first question comes from Charles Liu. Will CARB share performance results of completed projects? Currently, we have on our program administrators hosted a website, a map of where the projects are being spread throughout the state in terms by equipment type and the amount of funding that was received. I don't believe there's any other information we currently broadcast to the public, uh, but we share results of you know, where equipment is you know, benefiting in priority populations. Um, but if there's other recommendations and metrics that we could or should share, uh, we'd be open to considering that. The next question comes from Robert Brown. What will the voucher amount for top handlers be and how will it be determined? Thank you, Robert, for this question. Uh, we didn't, for this category, we had currently allowed a case-by-case -case determination where a manufacturer, the intent of the program is to cover the incremental cost difference between uh, the cleanest available engines and zero emission. And where possible, we're looking to move away from that to determine uh, a voucher amount based on some more straightforward metric where we're not relying on manufacturers describing their uh, incremental costs individually. One option we're considering is looking at if, if the equipment is battery powered, looking at paying on a dollar per kilowatt hour as a potential option. Uh, we'd be open from, to hear from stakeholders if that would be an appropriate way to do this. We have a number of different battery chemistries that exist currently. And what would that mean for each category uh, is, is to be determined. For instance, right now we pay $400 per kilowatt hour for the mobile power unit and aircraft ground power unit category. And this is the way in which we determine their voucher amount. So this could be a model for others. I don't know if $400 is the right number for all categories, but it's an option we're looking at considering. That being said, the current voucher cap is still $500,000. Thanks, Matt. Um, next question from Terry Maines. Um, minimum usage is going down from 800 hours per year to only 200 hours per year. Um, that's, that's worth thinking about. There are some categories, for example, uh, switchers uh, have a tough time. They don't operate very many hours. They're having a tough time reaching those 800 hours. Um, one solution we're thinking of is just dropping them the usage to, at, you have to use at least 200 hours a year. Um, that, that falls in line with the um, off-road implementation uh, regulation where low use is 200 hours a year. Um, if you think there's a, a different way we can do this, uh, Terry, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but that's that's our thinking right now. You're welcome. So um, I'll answer this question from Angela Richards. Uh, the question is, during the previous work group, it was mentioned that agricultural off-road equipment tractors would be eligible for the next round of core funding. Is that still the case? Um, yes, in my presentation, um, one category is, is agricultural equipment. Um, we'd love to see many zero emission tractors uh, out in the fields in, the, in, the, in California, in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, that, would be, that would be awesome. Uh, so yes, tractors are, are eligible. Um, if you have a manufacturer that you're thinking about, um, make sure they get in contact with uh, CalStart or, or myself, and get them on the list uh, so you can help uh, purchase with a voucher, a agricultural tractor. So the next question is from, from Dave Cook. Um, um, so can you comment more on the manufacturer purchase changes? So are, are you talking about um, uh, like uh, the POs and, and letters, letters of intent that I was talking about earlier? 
if, if that's the case, um, or, or the manufacturer self-purchase, uh, the manufacturer self-purchase. Um, so, I mean, the, I, th I think the, the, the best example I have that, you know, we're coming from the off-road world is that, um, oh, self-purchase. So, so yeah, so, um, so yeah, we'd like to, to include this in the, in the new IM, um, self purchases for, for your, your own equipment for a certain amount of time and then be sold to a, 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 uh, a, a, a end user. So, um, I think we need to talk. I think this is uh, specific for, for, for you, Dave, and, and your company. Um, if you want to talk more, more of this online and how we can make this this better, um, that, that would be great. I thought Dave has got his uh, hand raised. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute you, Dave. Yeah, I was just curious. You mentioned the six-month minimum, and I didn't understand how that worked because I would have assumed a self-purchase piece of equipment had the same 200 hour minimum usage uh, per year for the three years. Well, I think the self-purchase six months and the minimum hours used are, are two different topics. I think that uh, operating a piece of equipment 200 hours a year um, is, is fair uh, for, low, for low use pieces of equipment. And then the self-purchase for six months would would um yeah i thought we're not allowing self-purchase we closed that door because the only reason that door was open in the beginning when we first launched core as a program was we weren't sure about the state of technology across all the various industries and markets and so we were just at, but given the fact that we received applications two times as two times as much as we received funding we had closed that door and, and I think that actually the letter of intent is a nice way to kind of transition that through in terms of empowering the user before they decide to purchase. That way they can see whether or not the zero emission technology really works for their duty cycle. Um, but I don't, I don't know that we were going to reopen the self-purchase. And we were requesting to, you know, to have that stay around uh, for the switchers uh, because it's a new category. And that's one of the challenges in the rail industry is people want to see equipment actually work. So if we can't get a customer to buy into it before it's been uh, put into service, but demonstrated, um, then we, we can't get to the core voucher process. So we were requesting that that be carried over for switcher locomotives at least as it's a brand new category. So question, does that mean that the letter of intent doesn't work for you? If somebody's, I mean, if they're considering it and, and they're also just um, provide, you know, you provide, they, they want to actually use the equipment to make sure that it works for what they need it to do. I, I'm in the rail industry and they'd prefer that we all just go away and let them continue running diesel. You know, we have to be forward leaning and getting equipment out there and showing it operating before they'll take any interest because they're perfectly happy with 50 year old switcher locomotives because they do the job just fine. And, and this it's just a weird application. And, mm -hmm. and the core happens to be the best way to move this forward. The self-purchase option for at least one locomotive in a new category would have helped stimulate that possibly. Mm -hmm. I think about that one a little bit more. But it, it, it sounded like you guys are you know having two discussions on that um and that's why i wanted to clarify on that i didn't understand the six month uh rest i didn't know if that was you couldn't sell it for six months or oh. you had to sell it in six months on that six month timeline oh no the the six months is the funding cap which means that that we're just trying to make sure that the markets and the industries are competing in the right um plate you know the playground the yard trucks don't come that way the yard trucks don't compete with the rail car movers that's the six month funding cap is that what you're talking about no no the, the, there was discussion earlier in the slide presentation about the self-purchase and there was a six month 
something about it had to be sold within six months or it couldn't be sold for six months. I'm sorry, I don't remember that. Yeah, so so I did mention that that was, that was part of the presentation that um, self purchase had to be uh, uh, purchased for six months before before it's sold. Okay, so the the OEM has to maintain possession of it for a minimum of six months, and then after the six month period, uh, it can be sold to anybody. And the core voucher is applied to whoever purchases the equipment. I think that that, that overlaps with that OEM, OEM equipment going to rental companies, right? Because there's that overlap between uh, OEMs, uh, you know, only selling to certain rental companies. So, so if a, you know, a, you know, uh, a skid steer or something like that is is being rented, um, then it's with the the, uh, the OEM can op own it for months and then. Uh, goes to a rental yard. It could be purchased by a rental yard or sold to a a uh, a customer down the road. And and this is a good topic then, because because that actually is likely how zero emission switchers will perforate into the industry is through leasing programs, because the the customers really don't want to buy into any more new technology. They've had such bad results with all the incremental diesel emissions upgrades that they're really quite leery. So core could be a big help in moving that, that forward through these vouchers, allowing leases at your smaller rail yards, which are less of a risk of having interruptions due to whatever challenges could come up with a new technology. Whether the challenges are real or not doesn't matter. The rail industry is used to you know equipment lasting for 25 to 50 years. So they're, it's just, it's an odd environment. I, I, I can't think of any other industry except Marine where the equipment lasts so long. So and anyway, I, I, we'll, we'll keep talking about that. I just wanted to clarify on that six months. Thanks. No, great, great questions. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, we've answered a bunch of questions. Amber, do we have it? Let's, I guess I can check myself. Yeah, we, we do have a, a couple of okay. raised hands. Super. Um, first one here is from Nick Chase. You've just been unmuted. Uh, please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Uh, Nick Chase with Bolt House Farms again. Uh, the last uh, commenter mentioned Lisa's and it, it uh, raised a question for me and that is, um, is a lease to own arrangement allowable? Can you get a voucher if you are leasing to own? Or in other words, if you're financing the equipment, and I, I'll be honest, I don't remember from the last round um, if that was allowed or not, or if it had to be a cash purchase, but can you receive a voucher on a financed piece of equipment? Um, Matt, I think Matt, you have if you could to answer yes. that question, if you could ask that question, Matt. Uh, the answer is yes, but yeah, double check that, Matt. Did we lose Matt? I think that they were eligible, Nick. And I think that, the, uh, oh, there, Matt, I do see Matt now. Yes. Uh, Nick, can you repeat the question to make sure I answer? Oh, it was more one. about the lease. So Nick, Nick was asking whether or not lease to own or leasing was an eligible purchase mechanism versus a uh, straight out purchase. I right. think we were silent on a lease to own. Uh, we had a line that we drew on short-term leases that were less than three years. Mm -hmm. And therefore a leasing agent would be the requester and recipient and responsible. If the lease was for great three years or greater then the end user would be the one who would sign the terms and guns, be responsible for the hours of use. And the terms of that on a lease to own, I believe we were, uh, not, we did not speak to. I would need to confirm further if by taking another look at the implementation manual or looking or speaking with our program administrator regarding that aspect of the program. Okay, so if I understand if, if we if I put a tractor on a five year lease with a $1 buyout, uh, sounds like that would still qualify 
potentially qualify for a voucher. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. The, the, the key thing to know, Nick, is that the public funds have to be reimbursable. So if if the lease agreement, that's the thing is we can't, the voucher amount can't be more than what the leasee has to pay for in that lease term. So that's the thing that we're watching out for. The it, the intent is to make sure the value of the voucher is being passed on to the end user, yes. whether that's through a purchase or a lease. Mm -hmm. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. We have a raised hand from Mark Roast. You have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak and state your name and affiliation. Hello, I'm Mark Roost with Sustainable Energy Inc. And I'm an advisor to the Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. And my question has to do with conversions um, are across, and I apologize for coming in late. I was on the other CARB show uh, meeting until just a minute ago. So um, the question has to do with whether um, we can get funded for doing conversions of on-road and off-road vehicles. And if there's uh, any way to, you know, where I can get a summary of how much funding is available for each category and situation. And this is for converting from diesel to full battery electric, by the way. Thank you for your, your question, Mark. So for eligible categories of equipment, we do allow conversions. The you know, program is intended for you know, supporting off-road equipment. The only one that blurs that line slightly is the yard tractor equipment category. So if you have applications in the proposed equipment types that are legacy to the program regarding freight or the new proposed ones regarding construction, agriculture, uh, we'd, we'd like to hear from you. How um, I would like to hear from you, work with you then, um, who and how should I go? Should I use Todd Sperling's contact here that's on the questions and contacts? Or should I go to you? What should I do to explore this further? You can you can send your stuff right through me. Uh, my my email address should be on the screen. Got it. It is. Thank you very okay. much, Todd. Perfect. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we do have another raised hand from Dave Cook. And Dave, you have just been unmuted. Yeah, thanks. And, and I just wanted to comment on the leasing uh, and the lease to own um, subject again, because it sounds like on the, the lower end of the market with the, the construction tools and, and the smaller items, you guys are seeing that it's a rental market that'll help push that out. And, and kind of another way to look at it, you know, that's the small end of the market. And on the very top end, as I've been kind of commenting, I, I think there's leasing will be the way to, to move more of these out in, in different areas to build up the experience, which really is the mission of core. And I think when we talk about a self purchase for a switcher locomotive, we ought to think of it more like a rental of the other equipment. Uh, but I do understand you guys want to have a mechanism to avoid you know, self purchases being used for a different reason, but just wanted to throw that out there in that discussion. I, I wouldn't want switcher locomotives and hand tools to be considered the same category, but but they both have kind of the same problem is is purchases aren't so much likely, but people will want to to see them in use and and be able to to try them out um, at least on the switcher locomotives. For a couple of years in, until they've demonstrated durability, more durability. Um, and then I had a question. Uh, I, I think you guys have covered it, but we haven't mentioned it. There used to be a 25-year clause on converted or, or retrofitted equipment. And I, I believe Matt is perfectly aware, and, and Todd might be also, that you can't use that limit on locomotives. These chassis are, are 50 years old. And you know, can you guys comment on that? Thanks. 
So yes, Dave, as we had spoken you know, previously about the the existing structure we have was regarding uh, predominantly yard tractors as a eligible conversion that we inherited that category from HVIP and some of those metrics. And yes, locomotives are built different. Uh, and I think that to the extent possible, we want to reflect what is standard in the industry. So if there are metrics for determining that this chassis is appropriate, it's going to live on for uh, X number of years. You know, if there's something we can point to, great. If there's something we need to draw a bright line on that's reasonable, then we welcome stakeholder feedback on that. And that goes for other categories that we're looking at too. Our conversations with some marine stakeholders have also pointed that out. The, that existing threshold would be uh, challenging for some boat owners. Okay, I just wanted to, it hadn't been mentioned. So I just wanted to make sure that it was brought back up again. Or hadn't been mentioned recently. Okay, thank you. Right. So Todd, did, you want to, did you want to move on to some of the written questions? Well, uh, let's let's do. Um, sure, let's do do some of the, some of the questions here. Um, uh, the first one is from Terry uh, Mains. Uh, can you reiterate where POs will be needed versus where L, um, letters of intent will be required? I'm having some trouble wrapping my head around this. So. There were some situations, for example, for government agencies and for um, uh, owners who are co-funding uh, equipment where uh, a PO could not be uh, used at the, at the voucher, at the time the vouchers um, asked for. Um, in this case, we're, we're, we're saying if that's, if that's the case, uh, we, we, we would accept a, a letter of intent. Um, in, in lieu of a purchase order. Um, I hope that answers your question. It's a little in the weeds, um, Terry, if, if you'd want to sit down and talk about this um, after this meeting, um, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, the next question is from uh, Amy Kumel. Uh, what is the current thinking of for how long vouchers can be redeemed? I think I heard six months with two extensions. Um, that is what we have in there right now. And then we also have, uh, it could be done on a case by case basis. And what we're running into is um, vouchers that, that, that um, never end, right? So, so we, we need to make a line in the sand somewhere um, is that, uh, six months with two extensions? Is that 18 months? Is that six months with one extension uh, of six months? We're, we're trying to come, come up with a, with a, with a, with a uh, time that one, we can live with here in the, in the um, incentive world that we can spend the money uh, in, the, in, a, in a, the right amount of time. And also um, we understand the, uh, the other side of the coin is the, we understand the equipment you know, is not sometimes you know off the shelf that has been made. Uh, we're also running into problems with you know COVID and um, uh, supply uh, chain issues. So, so what is that time? And if you can help us out with that, Amy, um, that that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so the next is um, from Scott Land Land Isina. I hope it didn't murder that too bad. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Uh, Dinar would concur that lease and lease to own are requested funding mechanisms for, by our customers. We are placed with leasing options. Uh, simply not certain how utilization within core could would work. I'm open to add conversation and or wait for implementation manual updates that may reflect your decision. Uh, thank you. So uh, Scott, yeah, so yeah, definitely look forward to talking to you about this. Um, uh, great comment. So 
So the next question is uh, from Terry Maines. Uh, with supply chain issues, you might want to err on the side of longer time periods for voucher use. Uh, that is correct, but what, what is that time frame? So again, it just can't go uh, indefinitely. We have to end it at some point in time. So what is that time? We're trying to, you know, we can sit in our office all day long and come up with timelines, but uh, what's realistic, uh, but, but still be the timelines that we need to meet. So if you could help us out with that, we'd appreciate it. Amber, do we have any other hands raised? We do have one from Mark Roast. Mark, you have been unmuted. Please unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Mark Roost, Sustainable Energy Inc. and Silicon Valley Clean Cities Coalition. It seems like timelines could be developed based on the pro progress and the resources that being made available to the developers of the technologies because I think that part of the issue has been, for instance, in heavy trucking, um, that the battery technology has not yet been good enough to push a truck five or 600 miles uh, with a full payload on a class eight truck. And um, the, the 2000 pound allowance is helpful, but it, it, there's still a question there and we're working on up, but just a reminder that the core program is intended for off-road equipment so we we okay. don't have you know weight think... over the road weight limits and allowances so if oh, you have okay. a question regarding the... Well, the, the i think the question then is you know how long does it take the supplier to come up with a, a solution and there's i think what, where i've heard previously is people have been saying you know, we, we signed up for this thing and it's a year later, two years later, we still don't have it. And it could be because of the technology supply and it could be because of the utility. So it may be the way that you could develop your timelines would be uh, based on you know, looking at each category and the supplies, the supply side timelines, and then adding six months or a year to that and saying that's the cutoff. And, and that in general is what we're looking to do. And, and thank you for your comment. We understand that the different equipment has different lead times. And we understand that the, due to a number of issues over the last year or two, that those normal lead times have changed. So what we're looking to do is, as we look to make changes to the implementation manual, is to, where appropriate, put a reasonable time for delivering an installation and then what is reasonable for requests for extensions with some end date that's appropriate because we've spent a lot of time going over request after request for you know, a number of instances. And we're looking at a way to make it clear for manufacturers and applicants up front that well, this has an end point and, yeah. but also be reflective of each piece of equipment, unique lead time and the market conditions. There's a saying that the best way to predict the future is to make it happen. And in the case of working with inventors, small, small uh, organizations doing technology development, the best way to make it happen is often to fund them um, because funding, funding for unproven technology is a really wickedly difficult problem um, unless you're gonna go VC and you're attracted to VCs and we can't go to VCs. Uh, well, just, just to reiterate, Mark, this program is intended for commercially ready equipment and commercially available equipment. Yeah. Uh, we have other funding programs that are specific to uh, prototyping, demonstration and early pilot applications uh -huh. uh, for you. both on and off road, but that is, that is not the intent of this program. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Super. Thank you, guys. Um, let's see. Any other questions in Q&A? Um, no more raised hands. So um, why don't we wrap this up? We're almost, almost at time anyway. 
So again, um, my name is Todd Sterling. This, this uh, work group has been awesome. We've got received a lot of good questions and comments. If you come up with any other questions, um, you know, you think about later on the day today or, or next week, um, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, we're always ready to sit down and talk to folks, um, think of some better ideas on how we can do things better, make things more streamlined, easier for uh, folks to get a voucher. Um, that That's all great stuff. So um, I want to thank everybody who participated in this from, from myself and the team here. Um, uh, again, the great conversation and uh, great ideas and I uh, look forward to our next work group meeting at our next meeting. So thank you all very much.